Welcome to the preaching ministry of First Cumberland Presbyterian Church of Chattanooga. This recording is simply the sermon portion of our worship service. To experience our full worship service, we encourage you and invite you to join us Sunday morning at 11 in our beautiful sanctuary located at 1505 North Moore Road. We continue our look at the Sermon on the Mount this day. We are now in chapter 6 and we're beginning with the 19th verse and I'll be reading through the 24th verse. Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moss and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters. For a slave will either hate the one and love the other... Or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. My brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Back in 2004, 19-year-old Tokyo College student Marie Kondo began a tidying consultant's business just in order to help her make a few, uh, tie a few loose ends, pay a few of her bills. Little did she know that 17 years later, her book, Helping People Know How to Tidy Up and Unclutter Their Lives, would have sold more than 11 million copies in 30 different countries. She ha she's had her own Netflix TV special series on decluttering their, your life. It's kind of ironic that this woman who has been preaching for her whole career now, living simply and being decluttered, is now worth millions and millions of dollars. And if you know anything about her, you know that her method for decluttering is somewhat simple. You are to take an object and hold it or look at it and, and ask yourself the question, does this object bring me joy? And if the object doesn't spark joy in you, then she says, thank it for the service that it has been to you and then give it away or throw it away or sell it. But whatever you're going to do, do that to it immediately so that you're getting it out of your life because she recognizes that things that don't spark joy in us just clutter our lives and take up our time and our attention and, and they tend to make our lives less than what we want them to be. Now, I don't really know much more about Marie Kondo than that, although if you were to look at the state of my office here or even my home office at home, you would say, well, maybe you ought to learn a little more about her because they are certainly cluttered. <clears throat> but what I understand is that what she is trying to teach us, whether she realizes it or not, is pretty much the same thing that Jesus is teaching us in this morning's scripture lesson in the Sermon on the Mount. At first glance, that, those, that passage seems to just be a bunch of random verses kind of strewn together. Uh, don't lay up, make sure you lay up your treasures in heaven and not on earth. And, and he has that section there about the eye is the lamp of the body and that kind of thing. And then he has a section about serving God and mammon. And it might just seem to be three random proverbs or something. But in fact, Jesus' point is that central part about the eye illumines, if you will, both the part about storing up treasures and the part about serving God and not serving mammon. And so let us uh, recognize that it's how we look at things which can help us determine what we are to do with them and how we are to treat them. Much the way that Marie Kondo says, look at something and see, does it spark joy for you? We could ask ourselves further with what Jesus says is not merely does it spark joy, but does it help me to serve God? Does it help me to be grateful and be thankful to God? And then does it help me to be generous with whatever it is that I might be the best servant I can, helping that object perhaps to spark joy in others as well? Jesus is warning us, be careful about how you look at things, because if you look at things in the wrong way, they're going to lead you in the wrong direction. And so we are, as he says, to look at heavenly things. 
Now, as we have learned every single week in this study, when Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven, he isn't talking exclusively about the kingdom to come in the far off future or the kingdom that we enter into when we die. But he tells us the kingdom of heaven is near. And so he's not telling us that we can't have possessions, but rather what he is telling us is <clears throat> that um, our possessions need to help us experience the kingdom of heaven in the here and the now. Really, exactly the way Marie Kondo says, do they spark joy in us? Do they spark senses of thanksgiving? And do they help us share with others the goodness of God? And so that is why Jesus warns us that we cannot serve God and mammon. Not saying that we can't have possessions, but rather saying that uh, if we, and then that very word cannot, you cannot serve God and mammon, uh, literally comes from a word that says you will not have the energy or the power. If I spend all of my energy and all of my power serving mammon, I will not be able to serve God. Or if I spend all of my energy and my power in serving God, I will not have the energy or the power to serve mammon. So he's saying that we need to be careful about what we put our, entry, our intra energy into so that we are making sure that the things that we own are things that we own rather than that they are things that own us. Tennessee pastor Mike Erie says that years ago he had an old truck and he loved that old truck, but it was an old truck. And so when his kids spilled juice boxes in the back seat, he didn't really mind and he didn't bother washing it all that very often. It's just an old pickup truck. Once he was in a grocery store parking lot and somebody accidentally bumped into him, put a little scratch on it, and they were so apologetic and so upset and promised they would call their insurance company and get it taken care of. And he said, ah, it's just an old truck. Don't worry about it. He wasn't the least bit concerned. But after a while, the old truck uh, got to where he couldn't use it anymore. It was just too old. And this time he bought a new truck. And he says, without even thinking about it, everything changed. Now when one of his kids spilled a juice box in the back, uh, he began yelling at them, what are you doing? This is a new truck. You can't mess up my new truck. Before it didn't matter. Now it seemed to matter so much. He would now spend at least one day and sometimes two days washing the truck rather than spending time with his family or doing other things that, that he could do. He wanted to keep that truck as pristine as possible and so he washed it. He said he would go to the grocery store and he would park where he was way at the back of the lot to make sure that nobody would accidentally bump into him. He didn't want his truck to get scratched. And he said it began to dawn on him that he really didn't own that truck, but the truck owned him. He had become the truck's servant and so he couldn't spell anything in there he had to spend all the time taking care of it he had to park it way away he was serving the truck more than the truck was serving him now he doesn't say what he did with that truck or what the end of that story is but that is a wonderful example of how our possessions can be possessions that serve us and his old truck did just that but our possessions also can be things that we discover that we are serving them and if we do that then we discover that uh, uh, um, we are spending way too much energy on them and not energy on the things that we need to or we want to and even things that can spark joy in us. As you probably know, Lee and I own a little horse farm and we have in front of our house a, a, a fence that's a few hundred feet long, I guess, a wonderful, beautiful horse fence. And so oftentimes when I'm driving around the country, I will see another horse fence somewhere and it'll be uh, set uh, in front of uh, more horse property. And oftentimes it'll be a lot bigger place than ours. And I'll look up maybe up on a hill and see a big, beautiful house up there and big, beautiful barns. And maybe it has a wonderful view of the mountains and these rolling pastures and miles and miles of fences. And for a moment there, my eyes begin to grow a little dim when I think about uh, my place back at, at our place that doesn't have all of those amenities and isn't that nice. And my place for a little bit doesn't feel so great. But then I have learned that I need to think. I need to think back to when we first bought our place. When we first bought our place, the fence in front of our house uh, had uh, some boards that had not been painted. When the owner was trying to sell the place, he fixed some of the boards that were, were missing or broken, but he didn't have the time to paint them. All of the fence needed to be painted. And the first few months that I was here, when I would come home in the afternoons, I had a little wagon and I had a, a big uh, a tub of paint in there and paintbrushes, and I would haul the wagon out to the road and I painted that whole fence 
by hand, 30 minutes one day, maybe an hour the next, whatever time that I had to devote to the fence painting. And it took months to paint. And I kind of enjoyed it. It was a nice way to kind of wind down at the end of the day. But it was hard work and it was long work. And so now when I'm driving by some property that has miles and miles of fences and I'm starting to covet these people's property and, and, and starting to imagine what would it be like if I lived there and, and then my eyes, as I said, are kind of dimming towards my own property, I remember that fence painting and I smile to myself and I say, I don't want to paint all that fence though. That would be way too much fence to paint. And it's a way for me to remind myself that the things that I own are things that need to serve me and they need to serve God, but I don't need to serve them. And it really works for me. I think what I want to sh share that with you because I think what that says, at least the way it works in my life, is that I can't just make a commitment. I'm going to serve God and not mammon. But it's a commitment I have to make almost every single day. And I have to have these disciplines that help me make that commitment. Otherwise, I'm just going to accidentally kind of drift into serving mammon. But when I see those fences and I start feeling that covetousness, I just think, I don't want to paint them. And that changes everything. We all need to develop spiritual disciplines so that we are truly serving God and not mammon, God and not wealth. Because when we do that, uh, then they, the things we own have become our masters rather than we, their masters. But it's not enough simply to say that our things need to serve us. We also must make sure that we're using our things to serve others. Sometimes we read a passage like the one that we just read today and people think, well, I give 10% to the church or I give X percent of my income away and so I must be okay. And that is very important. And I want to encourage you to be generous towards the church. I want to encourage you to be generous towards charities and other things with, with your money. But in some ways, I think Jesus is saying the things that we don't give away that in, in generosity the way that we use those may be even more important than the things that we give away. How do you use your things for the glory of God? Not only to spark joy for you, but to spark joy for other people. Lee's grandparents taught us how uh, to do this, at least in part, again, with our property. They owned a lake house, and it was a wonderful a vacation spot for their family, and their family built many, many wonderful, wonderful memories at that lake property. But they didn't use it exclusively for their family. They recognized that that lake property was property that God had entrusted to them, and they used it in wonderful ways as a, as a witness and as a ministry. They let uh, school groups come over and ministry groups come over and they let study school classes come over and they had huge even church-wide events there. Pastors and seminary presidents and missionaries were invited to come and spend time uh, there and unwind there. And uh, for the whole time that they had that property, they were wonderful, wonderful stewards of it. And one of the things that I think they discovered was not only did that spark joy for all of those other people who were able to use it, but it also sparked joy for them as well. Uh, Lee and I have tried to do that with our little horse farm. And just this week, we had the Bridge Chattanooga uh, uh, kids come up. They are middle school children from uh, urban, uh, not quite inner city, but urban Chattanooga. And many of those kids have had very few opportunities to have outdoor recreational opportunities and to experience God in the great outdoors. And one of the, the standard things they do when, when we're taking a group through is they come to our farm so that they can ride horses and, and get a little feel for what it's like to, to be on a farm. And this week it was eight middle school young men. And as they got out of the car, there was, there was one young man who was really the biggest young man there, looked like a football player, looked really athletic, but he was scared to death of the horses. He wasn't going to get near the horses. He didn't want to feed the horses. He didn't want to pet the horses. He didn't want anything to do with the horses. But we have our little way. We've learned how to kind of help kids come along. And by the end of that afternoon, he was not only on top of a horse, but he's actually trotting the horse a little bit in a rudimentary little way and having a wonderful time. When we broke up and, and, and had supper and then we're finishing supper, you know, Kayla and Morgan, the two leaders of, of Bridge, were kind of doing a debriefing with the kids and asking them what was a highlight and what was a low time for that day. And this, this great big uh, football player looking kind of kid, he said, now I always was going to get on a horse. I wasn't really scared. I was just pretending that I was scared. But I was always going to get on a horse and I was always going to trot. And obviously that wasn't true. And he knew it wasn't true and everybody else knew it wasn't true. But what was really wonderful was as we were finally breaking up at the end of the night, uh, they were getting ready to go back to the cars and come back to Chattanooga he said wait a minute wait a minute we're all in a circle right here I want Pastor Courtney to pray for us 
And it was so powerful for me to hear a middle school young man say, I want to be prayed for. We can't leave this place until we pray. And so I prayed a prayer mostly of thanksgiving for those young men and prayed a prayer of blessing on them as well. Do you think that didn't spark joy in me? Of course it did. And I hope that God is pleased with the way that we're trying to use our property. And I'm not trying to brag about what we're doing. This is just an example of of one of the ways that we try to be generous with the things that we have. What I do want to suggest is that Jesus is saying to us that that is the goal, that we would be generous with everything that we have and that the things that we have would be used to lead people to have great joy and even lead people to say, would you pray for me now because this has been such a great experience and I've encountered God in so many wonderful ways. The early church was known for sharing all of their possessions and no one was in need. And some people say, well, does that mean that they were socialist or they were communist? And, and the answer is not really because they weren't setting off a political system. What they were doing was they were living in the kingdom of heaven right here on earth. No one was in need because they shared all things just as in the kingdom of heaven. No one is ever in need, but all things are shared and all things are used for the glory of God. So let us take a cue this day from Marie Kondo, but much more importantly, let us take a cue from Jesus Christ. And let us uh, take great pleasure in the things that we need to take pleasure in. Let us be thankful for the things that God has given to us. Let us make sure that we are content and that they spark joy in us and then take that other wonderful extra step to find ways to share the wonderful things God has given to us with others that we might spark joy in them as well. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this message from the preaching ministry of First Cumberland Presbyterian Church. Once more, we hope you'll join us in person Sunday at 11 a.m. for worship.